the sequel scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. This is the word of God. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> there was a discipline of honesty. Uh, it's okay. We'll be, um, so, I've been trying to do a series on personal spiritual formation. Uh, what that means is um, we want our lives to be transformed by God's Word, uh, to be a person of wholeness, wellness, and spiritual well being. Um, Steve, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, actually, I have a PowerPoint. Can someone open up the PowerPoint for Steve? Um, it's going to be under. Uh, uh, I forgot to tell you guys. Sorry. It's going to be on the no, outside. Outside of the. It's going to be on the. Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, press function F F five. Or few slideshow or whatever. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, you know, I think when you say that you believe in Jesus, I think it should change us, like, to be a whole person, to be spiritually whole, to be a healthier person, emotionally, mindfully, whatever, in, in all aspects. And one of the things that we're trying to do is be, uh, that, that I want to focus on things that we should be changed in. Uh, so today's topic is actually about honesty, and this is a topic, I think, uh, we struggle as a, as a community because uh, I think we all lie and we think lying is okay uh, We think that white lie doesn't hurt anyone. Uh, so that's what we're going to be speaking about. So let's pray Father we thank you for your word father would you help us to be a uh, people of truth people uh, people who do not lie Father would you anoint me to speak your word and would you uh, be with the hearers of God's word to be transformed by your word? And uh, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, contemporary spiritual formation may need to be uh, may need to deal with honesty more intentionally because of the culture uh, predilects for dishonesty. So, this is what our culture teaches us. Next. A recent Gallup poll indicates that 75% of the population felt that lying was necessary in daily life. 75% of the people thought that lying was necessary to live their daily life. Next. A recent ABC news special showed that children had to learn to lie by the age of five. Next. The same special showed teenager lying about finding a modicon 65% uh, of the time. No, please don't open. Thank you. It's hard doing it here. There's a sign, guys. Thank you, guys. Uh, prominent next. Prominent uh, political leaders in our government have been exposed and lie uh, with their approval rating, but it goes largely unaffected. Uh, next, we have no reason to believe that church has been immune to this ethical decline in honesty and integrity. There is no reason for us to think we're any better than what our society does. So let's go to our verse today. Next. So the verse today, um, as we're going to learn, it actually talks about truth. Um, opposite of dishonest, opposite of, opposite of lying is to tell the truth, to be honest, right? Um, and the truth in Greek is called aletheia, and it means, truth means not concealed. So to lie means to conceal things. So to, truth means to not, uh, not conceal, to be in the open. So whenever the Bible says, like, the truth shall set you free, or, you know, you shall know the truth, and whatever, all those things means not concealed. That's what it's saying. Uh, and the verse here, it says this, that we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up in him who is the head of head that is Christ. Therefore, each of you must... Uh, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, and for we are all member of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are so angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Here, um, Paul teaches us that for you to grow up, you need to have the truth inside of you. And not only that, this is how you grow in Christ. Secondly, he says if you're Christian,
Christian, you're called to be in a community of truth tellers to each other. You're supposed to be in a place where people are kind of telling you the truth, telling you um, how to grow, telling you stuff that maybe you don't really want to hear, or even being honest with each other when you fall short. You know, sometimes um, you know, I, 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 I try to talk to some of you guys and different people in youth and different people in my life. And I talk to them, and sometimes it's like my words just doesn't get penetrated. And I think one of the reasons my word doesn't get penetrated is really because I'm the only one speaking. And I think it's kind of like, you know, let's say someone is, you know, in like some weird lifestyle that's not healthy for them. Instead of everyone telling them, hey, you're in a very bad track of life, you need to get out of this lifestyle, maybe, you, have, you know, there's a better life for you. Instead of everyone telling them, if the pastor is the only one telling them, it doesn't work. What the Bible calls us is that we're called to be in a community that speaks truth to each other. So for example, do you guys know why group therapy exists? You know how we have, like, when you go to counseling, there's therapists and there's you, and usually it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? But sometimes they want you to be in a group therapy. You know why? Because some people are super stubborn. And when you're stubborn, what helps is that you don't hear from one person, but a group of community calls you out on your thing, and then somehow, they can't argue anymore because before it was one-on-one -on -one and you're like, no, that's just your thought versus my thought. But now what happens is, well, this is how most majority think and this is not how I think. And a group therapy is necessary because of that. Next, please. Secondly, not only are you called to be in a community of truth, church needs to be a place not only where truth is spoken, but truth is spoken in love. And I want to confess before you guys... I know I love to mold you guys to be more like Christ and in the journey of that, maybe I wasn't so kind in my words, I want to apologize, but what the Bible calls us to do is um, be a community that tells each other truth and love, in care for one another, that when you tell them what they're doing is wrong, it's not necessarily just to correct them, but it's that you wish the best for them. That your desire is, no, I don't want you to go the wrong way. And my desire is to see you in the best light and in the best place that you ever be. Therefore, next. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray that each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We're supposed to be in a community of healing, community that confess sins to each other. Not only are we supposed to tell you when you're sinning, but you're supposed to confess your sins to each other. This is what it means to be honest. You see, there's three things that um, deception and lie kind of um, that brings into our life. And when we live in truth, it confronts those three things. And the first thing, um, Steve, next. First thing is this, truth confronts hypocrisy. Next. And in the verse here, Matthew 28, 27 to 28 says this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrite. And if you remember law, teachers of the law and Pharisees and hypocrites, these are like the pastors of the day. And he says, you are whitewashed tomb, which are beautiful on the outside, but inside full of dead bones and everything unclean. You're like a tomb. On the outside, it looks like this marble, nice tomb with the engravement on it and the fancy or whatever. But inside, there's bones decaying and flesh decaying, and you're just messed up on the inside. But on the outside, you just look good in front of people. It's hypocrisy. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. When you're not honest with people, what happens is you live this dual life in front of people. You might be this, ooh, Mr. Whoever or Mrs. Whoever, but in reality, you're a hypocrite because... Your insight is dirty, your insight is not true, your insight is not clean. And this is why honesty is important. You don't want to be in a trap where you feel like, oh, I'm not honest and I can never share my sin with people. Next, please. You are sick as the secret you keep. But that's something nice. Next. <laughs> so, truth is necessary. Next. For healing. Next. Next. 
And what it means is this, is that surely you, de you desire, and Psalm 51, 6 says this, surely you desire truth in the inner part. It's talking about your heart. You teach me the wisdom in the innermost place. So let me ask you a question. How does truth bring healing? You know, the, one of the things that truth confronts is hypocrisy. Truth is necessary for real healing. And so let's look at it this way. Let's say you're a person who feels very rejected. I'm a person who's rejected. Where is the truth in that? How does the truth heal you? Truth is that the Lord doesn't reject you. The Lord accepts you. The Lord loves you. And understanding God's truth sets you free from this lie of rejection. Let's say you're this uh, person who's really harsh. And you're like, I don't know why I'm harsh, but my personality is just harsh. And uh, the, the book that we're reading, Jack Deere, he, had, and he was just talking about it. And he was harsh when he became Christian. And, and the way that he deals with people, sometimes he's like, yeah, I know that I'm harsh. And I'm trying to work it through, but I just can't be set free from this harshness. I don't know what to do. And he was lacking truth in his life. And God revealed to him that one of the reasons you're harsh is because... You're really bitter. Your dad passed away. Your dad committed suicide. And you didn't really deal with it. And you didn't forgive God. And there, you, you created this bitterness in your heart that's really marked your life because this is your dad who passed away. And because of that bitterness in your heart, you have harsh attitude towards people. And it wasn't until he learned the truth, healing came into his heart. And it wasn't until he learned the truth where he could actually deal with it. You know, I always joke around uh, with MBS guys, and I, I'm always like, you know, it's like amazing. I go to my friend's church, and I'm like, you know, I have so many guys who struggle with glory. They're like, they all want to be like this top of the top CEO, go to the best school, and have the best job and whatnot. And then my friend goes, my friend, the other pastor, he goes, I struggle with people who have no desire to do any of that. They just want to be mediocre. They have no drive whatsoever. And when I heard that, I was like, I never struggle with my guys, I guess. <laughs> this is my personality, right? But at the same time, when you struggle with self-glorification, when you struggle with wanting to be CEO, the best of the best and whatever, if you're honest, the, the truth of the matter is that it stems from insecurity. The reason you want people to recognize you is really because you don't feel like you're good enough. It's really, you feel like you have to approve to someone Prove to people, hey, look how good I am. That when you tell people about what you're doing or what you're making money, you're basically essentially going, look at how much money I make. This is how cool I am. What is that entailing? At the end of the day, it is significant. It is it is it's showing that you're insecure. It's showing that you really want to show people so that you may feel confident. True, confident person does not need to brag about who they are. I don't think Bill Gates is going around telling people, look at how smart I am, look at how great I am, look at how much money I have. He's just busy giving it all away. If you're really secure in who you are, you're not busy telling people how great you are. And maybe it comes from also, it comes from, you know, maybe you think by your, and sometimes it's hard because like you think there's like a standard that you're supposed to reach at your age. If I'm 20, if I'm 30, if I'm 40, I'm supposed to be, you know, like at this much pay and this much in stage in life. Stop comparing yourself. Who cares? Like, seriously, stop comparing yourself. Everyone, like, it's kind of like, um, you know, moms and dads who worry about their kid. They're like, average by the age of one and a half, you're supposed to speak, and they're like, my son is not speaking. He's one years old. I don't know why he's not speaking. It says one and a half. My, you know, and it's like, even when they're one and a half, I'm like, it's an average. It's not really a number that everyone does. That's why it's called average. It's people who are good at it and people who are bad at it and average them out is one and a half. So it doesn't mean anything. And just because your son or daughter can't speak right away doesn't mean they're going to be an idiot or anything. They, they probably will be smart. Um, granted, have your DNA. And, you know, and I think, I'm just saying, yeah, I think there's like a lot of smart people, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm being really honest. I don't know why people are so like, it's like, no, you guys are all great. Like, you guys are like, dude, you guys are so awesome. Stop being insecure. Like, Stop trying to prove yourself to people, like, seriously, awesome, okay, awesome. I'm going to tell you, you're awesome, and hear that from God, and how do you heal, okay, it's not the other part, side note, how do you get healed from insecurity, how do you get healed from, you know, uh, rejection issue, how do you get healed from harsh attitude, all these things, listen to God's voice, this is what I mean, 
having relationship with God should make you whole. And what that means is, you hear from God and He says, you're good enough. And when you hear God's voice telling you, you're good already, that you're good enough, these jobs don't define who you are, how much money you make doesn't define who you are. When you start hearing to God of your worth from Him and go, God says I'm great, therefore I am. When you start convincing yourself of His truth, you start being set free. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. I think some of us, we try behavior modification and think that that's going to solve the problem. The problem is not behavior modification. The problem is not, I'm going to try to look more holy. I'm going to try to look more humble. I'm going to stop trying to talk about my job or how much money I make. That's all outer things that doesn't change on the inside. Just like the, the, the hypocrites, you know, the whitewashed tomb. On the outside, you look like you do everything right. I don't talk about my job. I'm very humble. I don't, you know. Yeah, on the outside, it looks like that. But if your inside doesn't change, Nothing changes. How do you change? Is when you hear God's voice in the innermost part and let His truth sink in and ring true higher than any other voice. And when you do that, you change from the inside out. Don't be into behavior modification. Don't try to be acting humble or whatnot. Be yourself, but in your who you are, Come to God as you are and hear God's voice, and that is the only way you'll be set free. You see, the third thing um, truth comes in is truth. True love requires truth. Next, please. True love, next. Next, next. Next. True love requires truth. Next. And the verse says in 1 John 6 and 7, it says this, If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. When it comes to God, there is no shame. It doesn't matter how you feel, how crappy you feel. It doesn't matter how much sin you think you have. It doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you had. It doesn't matter what you did before you came to church. It doesn't matter. Christ forgives us from all sin. Remind yourself of His love. Don't matter what kind of life you had. Doesn't matter what you did with your boyfriend or girlfriend in the past or whatnot. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter what you did in college. It really doesn't. Once you ask for forgiveness, it forgives us of all things. Remind yourself of God's love. And know that you're not rejected in His sight. And that's how you're going to come to Him over and over again. When you feel insecure, when you feel like you're not good enough, you come to God and, and you get reminded that God is in love with you and He sees your dirt, but He's not ashamed of you. And that's what's awesome. And the other thing, not only with God, true love, true love requires truth also in one another. You know, sometimes, you know, this is... When you come to know God, my whole premise is you come into a community of love and truth, right? That's what I'm trying to say. If you're in a relationship, if there is no truth, there is no love. What I mean by that is this. Let's say you have, you're this person of, have some loose past, you know, like you're like, you just... You have a history of cheating on, you know, like your significant other. It is not your choice to share or not share if you love the person. You have to share. Because to conceal the truth means you're not honest with them and you never gave them an opportunity to either accept you or reject you. You took that opportunity away from them. And now, because they don't know that, they have to accept you anyway. If you have done something where it significantly influences the person who you, are, who you are in love with, whether it be in relationship or in friendship, without truth, there is no love because you're deceiving them at the end of the day. You know, when I was dating G, she scared the crap out of me when we were first dating. She just had a, she made a slip, hopefully, with her words. You know, we're dating, we watched something, and she's sharing about her childhood. And you know what she says to me? She said it by mistake, hopefully. She said, when I was a boy, and I was like, we've just been together for two months. I'm like, what do you mean you were a boy? 
And then, you know, long story short, she was trying to share how she used to be like tomboyish when she was younger, but then like the words came out wrong. I'm like, but it's like, if you have, if you were like a transgender, I think you have to tell the truth. I got that, I'm not that my You know what I mean? Like, can you imagine you're dating and you're about to get married and for the person who might have had transgender in your life, you should love me just the way that I am, but you should give him or her the choice to do so. You can't conceal the matter because that's not love. And it's like kind of extreme, ridiculous scenario for most of us, and I'm sorry, but I'm just saying, truth is necessary because if you don't tell the truth and when they find out later, it crushes them and, and you just hurt them like in a way that you, you never, you know. And then there is no such thing as, let's say you're married and you cheated on them and you know they're never going to find out what they don't know won't hurt them. No! Love must requires truth. You must be honest. You can't hide stuff. You can't, and you know what was cool when I was dating G? Uh, and like, she scared me, not just in that way. She scared me with all the things. She's like, she just was so brutally honest about who she was. And I'm like, what? That's who you are? And then I think she was testing me. She was testing, you know, are you going to love me even if I am? And I did. But I'm like, man. You're like just scaring me with all your crap. <laughs> well, it's not crap, sorry. But you know what I mean? She was just truly honest. And, and she doesn't have crap. I'm sorry. Nice. I keep on digging. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, moving on. <laughs> no, she doesn't have crap. But you know, she was honest. And, and I think, don't you want to be in a place in a relationship where you feel like you're naked, but not really unless you're married? But you know, like you feel like you're naked as in they really know you for who you are. And they love you and accept you for who you are. That's exactly where you want to be, isn't it? And I think when you're called to be in a community of Christians, that's exactly what it means. To be in a community of love and truth. But there is a little bit of... Um, what's the word? Uh, warning, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Actually, uh, we'll go into... Um, yeah, we'll get into it later. All right, next, next slide, and one more. So concerning spiritual warfare, right? Let's say you're trying to grow in holiness. You know why being honest is important? If you're trying to grow in holiness, one of the ways that enemy stops you from growing in holiness is to tell you to conceal things. So one of the primary ways enemy tries to destroy us is through secrecy. Keep your private life private. Don't tell anyone. He knows that love is the food of the soul. You know, you want to be honest and still be loved, right? Like, I don't care who comes into our church. They could be homosexuals, transgender. They could be homeless. They could be anything drug addict. They could even be a pimp. They could be a dog pillar. My desire is you guys and myself will love them. Don't matter what kind of simple life they have. My desire is that they're loved and they will feel Christ's love and understanding that love. And I want all of you guys to feel like you could be totally honest with each one, and, and there's a warning later about that. Totally be honest and be loved and know that you are accepted. That your sin does not disqualify you. Your past does not disqualify you. That your love, no matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, no matter what you have injected into your body. And how Satan stops you from doing that is he, he whispers to your ear, keep it hidden. Those people are not going to love you if you're honest. You tell them your past, they're going to think you're the most worst person in the face of the earth. This is how Satan lies to us. Next, next, two, two. Thank you. Life in the flesh also feeds on deceit. That's why he, call, he is called the prince of darkness. Satan is called the prince of darkness. What does darkness mean? To conceal, to hide, is to not be visible. This is how Satan attacks us. Does that make sense? And this is how he wants you to live. You see, next, next. One of the things is this. Um, in a church history, confessing our sins and being honest with each other was a very normal thing. Pre-Reformation, before Protestant came about, um, in Catholic circle, they had, things, they had this thing called confessional booth, where you were able to go to a priest and tell them your sin, and no one would know other than the priest, and the priest is not going to tell anyone, 
and the priest would pray for you, and you get to confess your sin. You know, James 5 talks about confessing your sins to each other. Tell your sins to elders, and they'll pray for you, and you'll be healed. And this is normal. And then because of Reformation, uh, after Reformation, if you could go again. And then we lost that. And then next, Steve. And then post-Reformation, we had this prayer group where people had life group and they met together. They were honest with each other. They would pray for each other. Are you struggling with this? Let me pray for you. And this is what happened. And even now, we're kind of losing that as well. Next. And then in the Puritans, they had honest confession in the journal. And they had journals and they will write honestly. And, and sometimes they write about their sins. And if you know, uh, Augustine was not, is it Augustine? Augustine wrote a book called confession or something like that. He's not a Puritan, but he like literally has this thick book and uh, just details about how much he's a sinner. <laughs> Can you imagine like being that honest? Like, it's like, okay, yes, as of how simple you are. Confession. <laughs> Crazy. It's healthy for you to be, you know, if you don't, you know, I know we're individualistic society, Western society, individualistic society. Minimum you could do, be honest with yourself, you know, write a journal. Next. And, you know, it boils down to now, it's like hard things with your soul. And that's still good. But my desire is that we will have kind of like all four. That you will go to pastors and leaders and go, tell me how to be free from this. Tell me how to get rid of this sin. And we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of ways to help you. Come and ask and we'll help you. We'll help us. Secondly, Come to prayer group and be honest and don't be shallow. Don't be just about like, how's your week? My week, my week was good and that's good on Sundays. And, and I want you to do that Sunday. I don't want it to be like long and deep. Um, but you know, when it comes to like, when you're hanging out, be honest. Share with each other what you're struggling with. Share with each other how you know, you're struggling with this and that. Be honest with each other. You know, I'm struggling with glory. I'm struggling with money. I'm struggling with my worth and whatever, be honest. And third, have some journal. You know, I miss Zanga. You know, I used to have a lot of private notes on my Zanga and I used to like write all these stuff about my sins and my darkness and how, you know, how I felt and it was really good. And, and lastly, you know, share with each other how, how you're doing. And we're almost done. Next. Next. Be honest in prayer uh, with God as well. Don't, you're not called just to be honest with one another. You're also called to be honest with God. God knows everything. He loves you. Um, we're going to just skip that. Uh, we're going to uh, go next. 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 Yeah, we're going to go here. Next. 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 Okay, great. Um, I want to just have the whole thing. Uh, be honest in journaling. We already covered that. Be honest in prayer. Cover that. Keep your journals. Reread them. Celebrate your victories. You're not the same person when you do these things. Year later, you'll be much healthier. You've grown. Celebrate. Wow, I'm not the same person. Wow, I used to, you know, do this and do that. And I don't do it anymore. It's good. Be careful. And you may want to keep them in a safe place. And if you're mom and dad, and none of us are, don't violate your kids, you know, privacy. <laughs> And I don't know if you guys are wrong that. But it's like, you know, keep it in a safe place. This is your secret work. Lastly, this is where the warning is. Um, as much as I want you guys to be honest, some of us are just not healthy. And remember, it's not always safe to be open. And as much as I'm saying be open with each other, choose your people that you're going to be open with. You know, uh, I, this lady, uh, she was at a retreat, and she was going through a lot of turmoil, like, you know, like divorce and different things. And um, this lady, on her first meeting in a small group, she just opens everything up, like, I am going through a divorce. She's crying, and she's like, snot's coming out, and she's like, sharing with everyone that she never met before about all her problems. And then small group leader goes, I'm really sorry that you're going through that, and I feel for you, and I would love to talk to you afterward, but right now, we're not there. We don't, we haven't built that relationship with you yet, and you can't open up like that with everyone, and you just went, when we're not even there. You need to be patient with us, and as the retreat goes on, maybe we could talk about that, and I would love to talk to you afterward, and that is very true. You can't just be someone who's an open, I used to be an open book when I was younger, 
I still have kind of, I still have a hard time hiding my feelings, you know? If I'm hurt, I'm hurt. But, you know, like, you can't always be an open book for everyone, because not everyone's going to be honoring your crap. Like, crap, is that a bad word? Not everyone's going to be accepting your stuff, and you need to be careful, and, you know, and, 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 yeah, I want you to be careful, but I want you to be open, but choose who you're going to be open to, you know, and then there's a limit, and know who they are, and then, you know, be most open with your spouse, your significant other, right? But And, and be most open with your best friends, but, you know, like, have levels, and then if you don't have people who are really close to you, make some. Stop jumping around, and, you know, uh, I'm not thinking about it. Um, spouse or girlfriend, they're my best friends right now. <laughs> I go make girlfriends and boyfriends, but I'm not talking about <laughs> but I'm not talking about make boyfriend and girlfriend just to be honest or anything. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, like make some, make friends that are deep. Stop jumping around and make shallow friendship. Have a deep friendship and, and, and share with them. And um, I feel like there's a, you know, it, it, don't open up too fast concerning that. And find safe people, find a safe place. Uh, find a place where people will accept you for who you are. And I hope our church can be a place that will accept you for who you are, wherever you are. You know, I have a friend pastor, and you know, he, he's, very, uh, he's very biblical. And, and this pastor you know, was talking about how he came upon Women's One, and he was talking about how you know, homosexuality is sin. And then later, this member of his actually came to him and said, Oh... I don't think I should be going to this church anymore because you don't feel from the life, you know, you're not happy with me. And he's like, what do you mean I'm not happy with me? I struggle with homosexuality. And he's like, no, it doesn't matter if you struggle. We love you. And, you know, he was like really struggling and he thought everyone was going to shame him and whatnot. And then when he opened up, the community was very loving. He's like, dude. And they don't treat him differently. And I, I, I really hope this is like how you guys are, you know, like, love people and, and care for people. And in the light of that, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Please be loving towards people that come to our church and welcome them. Stop talking with each other. I think this is something in Staten Island because I was talking with Pete Annie and G and I'm like, why is this, what is so hard about when there's a new person that you want to get to know them and talk to them? And we realized, I think it might be a Staten Island thing. Staten Island people are rude. <laughs> Sorry, I just called all of you guys rude. <laughs> I live here, I got a too, you know, like I'm driving and someone cut me off. I'm like, wow, why can't you learn how to drive? And I was like, and Paul was next to me and I was like, Paul, was that like Stan Island of me? He's like, yeah, that's pretty typical Stan Island of driving. I was like, yeah, I think it's like rubbing off my head. I'm like, I know me too, but I'm trying my best to love people when they come, but please, please, please. People need to be loved when they come to church and accept it. Can you stop? Isolating people and not loving them. Please stop talking to each other when there's new people. Talk to them. I think it's a Stan Island thing. I think we need to repent and we need to really reach out. When people feel like, you know, there's an in crowd in the church, I think something's so wrong. Not that you can't have your best friend, but your best friend relationship should be inclusive. You know, let's say G and I are best friends. And even if her and I are best friends, it needs to be an inclusive friendship where people are able to come in and join us. Not I'm best friend, don't join me, go over there. Can we be a community that loves people? And I want to tell you guys, uh, I was talking to my uh, friend pastor, and you know what he said? He said, people will join, uh, people might check out, check out your church once. And he said this, he said, once is, you know, whatever. When it really counts is when they check out your church twice. Because they like your church enough to come the second time and, you know, he said, my church, you know, my church, he's like, my church are great when they come the first time. They're welcoming. The second time they come, they have nothing to say and they don't know what to do. They're like, oh, I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> like, that's how they are. And I'm like, oh. But he's like, but the second time is even more important than the first time because they actually liked you enough to come the second time. If they liked you enough to come the second time, you need to be more loving and, and really that's going to seal the deal almost. By the time they like you twice, most of the time, they're going to come back. The first time is, you know, first time, people who visit first time, probably are not going to come back like 80% of the time. But people who visit second time and they like it the second time, 70% of the time, they might come back. And I want you guys to know, you know, love people when they come. Accept them and, and talk to them. Don't just, don't just talk to your friends that you talk to. And I know you haven't seen each other. Like, just get over it. Um, <laughs> you know, get over it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, we're gonna end there. Sorry. Sorry for. Sorry for open, honest, and amazing. Huh?
Ten minute rant. <laughs> You're sorry. a sinner. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I kind of think I kind of think it's a it's a stand on a spiritual thing because um, no, I, I I'm, I'm being serious because uh, I'm sorry to say our our also our KM is known for not being welcoming and um, there are people who's been at our church uh, like like we have some moms who are sharing with everyone they're like I've been at church for three years. And finally, after three years, I kind of feel like I have my place. But for three years, no one really reached out to me. No one really, like, I, she just stuck it out. And that's how I feel. I'm like, only people that sticks around at our church are the people who kind of, like, stuck it out. Like, why is it so hard for them? You know, like, you need to be loving and welcoming. You guys need to, like, go out of your way to talk to people. You know? I know you love your friends. Talk to other people. You know, um, we were at Pastor Isaac's church. I went with the, for Easter service with uh, Eric and, and Jimmy. And Pastor Isaac's like, get into groups of two or three and pray for each other. And then, you know, um, I had my church people. I deliberately walked away to pray with the Pastor Isaac's church people because I'm like, I want to mingle. I want to talk to you guys. And not that I don't love my people. It's just, I feel like if you're having a joint thing, I want to talk to other people and I want to pray for other people. And I think... That should be a heart of a Christian to, to be a welcoming place, to be a loving place, to be a place where you're honest with each other. Let's pray. Talking way too long. Sorry. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for uh, this uh, discipline of honesty. Father, we pray that we'll be honest with each other, honest with you, um, honest in all the things. Father, would you help us to know that this is a safe place? Would you help us to know that um, we don't always have to put a false self so that people will love us. But Lord, that we would really um, be a church that loves each other, accepts each other no matter what. Uh, would you be with us? I pray all things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, we're going to go into time of worship. But before we do, I forgot to tell you, um, for that guy who struggled with women's sexuality, the whole church just loved on him. Nothing changed. And their stance didn't change. They believed that homosexuality is sin, but they were loving on him, and he was okay with it, and he was accepted. And, and you know, he's just like, he was very loved. And I think that's how church should be. Uh, if you guys could help stand, we're going to worship. <laughs>